song we will have our scripture reading and then we'll stand for the opening prayer five nine nine Let's see. trying to walk in the steps of the savior trying to follow our savior and king shaping our lives by his blessed example happy how happy the songs that we bring. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, let in pass of light. Trying to walk steps of the Savior, upward, still upward, we'll follow our guide. When we shall see him, the King, in his beauty, happy, how happy, the place at his side. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. If you'd like to follow along with the scripture reading this morning, I'll read from Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1-3. 
through 6. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto thy voice of the, of the Lord thy God. Blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. This concludes our scripture reading. Please stand for the opening prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this past week, for your careful watch over us, and keeping us safe. Father, we're thankful for this day that you have made. We're thankful for our help that allows us to rise from our beds and to be here this morning to worship thee on the first day of the week as I was commanded. Father, we're mindful of the sick that's been mentioned here this morning. Pray that you'll be with them, with the doctors, the medicine, that they will return to a better portion of health if it be thy will. Pray, Father, that you'll be with the shut-in, those that can't get out and around as they once used to. Pray that you'll be with them also. Father, we pray that you'll be with the missionaries the world over. Be with them as they left the comforts of this country and of their home and for the things that they've given up to go over and to spread thy word. Pray that you'll be with them, Father, for we know that there's times they're discouraged and pray that you'll give them strength and guidance that many souls may be saved to thee. Father, we pray that we will do our part in the support of the, their work. Father, we're thankful for each and every one that is here this morning. Pray that we will put away all the worldly thoughts, the outside thoughts, concentrate on the things that are said here this morning, that we may take the word and apply them to our lives, that we may live a better, happier life. Father, we're thankful for Brother Troy, Sister Susan, as they work here with us at Skyline. Pray that you'll be with him this morning as he stands before us and that we will be attentive to the lesson. Father, we're thankful for so many things that we know we are blessed beyond our needs and we're so thankful for thee, Father. Father, we pray that you'll be with us now as we continue our service. Watch over us, guide, guard, direct us. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning. Let's sing number 709. 709.
Most gracious Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before Thee once again this morning, Father. We, at this time, are so thankful for this bread, which represents Your Son's body, which hung upon the cross, Father. We are so thankful for that, and we uh, pray that we will really focus on what we are doing this morning and take this in a way that is pleasing unto Thee. In Christ's name we pray. This cup that represents Christ's blood that died on that cross. Please help us take of this in a well pleasing manner. In Christ's name, amen. separate act of worship we're commanded to give on the first day of each week. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to come together again here, Lord, and worship you. Lord, thank you for our jobs that you provided us, provided us with so that we can support our families. Lord, pray for the ones who are over, overseas fighting and risking their lives so that we can live ours. Lord, I pray now that we give with a cheerful heart. In Christ's name, amen.
presentation this morning will be number 770. If you would like to go ahead and mark that. 770. <coughs> 770. Psalm 4, Brother uh, Troy speaks to us. It will be number 746. <coughs> 7, 4, 6. Sing all three verses. 746. Oh, how sweet will be to me the Lord when he comes in glory by and by. What a song of praise will be our poor when he comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how sweet when he comes in the sky. What joy, what joy when he comes in glory by and by. We will have our robes all white as snow when he comes in glory by and by. Oh, be ready with the Lord to go when he comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how sweet when he comes in the sky. What joy, what joy when he comes in glory by and by. I am longing for that happy day when he comes in glory by and by. For with him I hope to soar away when he comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how sweet when he comes in the sky. What joy, what joy when he comes in glory by and by. Book of Deuteronomy chapter 28 will be our lesson text this morning as we begin our study. It's certainly good to see each of you with us this morning. We have several that are not here, but visiting. We're glad that you're here. And if you are visiting with us, you fill out a visitor's card there in the pew and leave it on the seat. We'd be grateful uh, for that. This morning we're going to ask four questions that we need to ask ourselves. We live in a great nation, which uh, uh, there's no doubt about that. Whenever you travel the world and you uh, uh, go to these foreign countries, you come home realizing just how good you do have it in America. And unless you go outside the country, you, can't, you don't realize that. Once you travel to a nation outside this country, you realize just how good it is to get back home on home soil, regardless of where you go there. We live in a great nation, and uh, yet at the same time, we know that this, this nation is not perfect. As a matter of fact, we are headed in the wrong direction as a nation. Uh, I think in the past uh, 50 years, we've seen it uh, digress. Uh, if you have uh, gotten your spiritual sword this past quarter, then if you've read any of that, you see some of the things that have been suggested in that particular uh, book uh, there, and uh, some things that we need to take note of. Things have changed. We've had some uh, major decisions, Supreme Court decisions in the past 50 years that have greatly affected this nation as a whole, and uh, then one recently for sure that it has affected this nation and will continue to affect this nation for years to come uh, there unless something can be done to reverse the situation uh, there. God has always promised to be with his children. One of the things that we as Christians can 
take comfort in is the fact that regardless of how bad any situation may get, we can always depend upon God. Now, that doesn't mean that God is going to guarantee that we're not going to suffer for the cause that is for Christianity. Because the Bible says, yea, all will suffer who live a righteous life. We're going to suffer persecution if we live like God would have us to live. The problem that we have is that we've never suffered. We've never had to suffer uh, because of the great nation that we are a part of. Our time may come, it may come sooner than we realize, that we will be persecuted as far as the Lord's church is concerned. So this morning I want us to look at four questions we might ask ourselves. Uh, the Bible teaches that we should be faithful. As was read a few moments ago, God uh, told Israel that so long as they did his will, that he would bless them. And most assuredly, he would bless them. Verse 7, The Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against thee, to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way, and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses, and in all that thou settest thy hand unto, and shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And so we can see, and we can see through the history of Israel, having the Old Testament, which is a history of the nation of Israel, we see how that God through the ages blessed Israel based upon the fact that Israel was faithful to God. Now, also you have in this particular chapter, we have the cursings, curses that God would bring upon them if they did not remain faithful to him. Verse 15, beginning, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments, his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy land, the increase of the can and of the flocks and of thy sheep. Cursed shall be uh, when thou comest in, and cursed shall be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke, and all that thou settest thy hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. And so we see God promises blessings, God promises cursings, all based upon the fact of the decisions we make in life, not only as individuals, not only as the church, but also as a nation as a whole. Now take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Jeremiah. Because in Jeremiah chapter 32, Jeremiah chapter 32, we see God as he pronounces the end of Judah. In chapter 32, beginning with verse 26, he says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, to the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall take it. The Chaldeans that fight against this city shall come and set fire on the city and burn it with the houses upon whose roofs they have offered incense unto Baal, poured out drink offerings unto other gods to provoke me to anger. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have only done evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have only provoked me to anger with the work of their hands, saith the Lord. For this city hath been to me as a provocation of my anger and my fury from the day that they built it, even unto this day, that I should remove it from before my face. Because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah, which have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, and the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they have turned unto me the, their, the back, and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have hearkened not to receive instruction. And of course we see through the history of Israel how that God delivered on the message that he said. He said, I would bless thee if you follow me. I will curse thee if you, curse, if you do not follow me. And, of course, we see that being fulfilled here in the book of Jeremiah. Now, we know that God exhorts us to be faithful to him. We must be faithful. Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee the crown of life. Notice that we're promised the crown of life if we are found faithful unto God. 
And we refer to that many times as individuals uh, being faithful unto God, which is true, but at the same time, nations must be faithful to God as well. And we can see through history how that God has taken down the nations. At one time, who would have ever thought that Alexander the Great, that is, the Greek Empire, would have fallen? But it did. Who would have ever thought the Roman Empire would have fallen? But it did. All great empires have fallen throughout the ages once they quit doing what God would have them to do as far as righteousness is concerned. They turned their backs, as did Israel, against the God of heaven. In Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, Joshua, in speaking unto the children of Israel as he was about to uh, give up, I guess you would say, the reins of leadership at this particular time, says... It, he says to the people there, you have to make a decision, a choice, whether to follow the, the gods of your fathers or to follow the God of heaven. Choose you this day what you shall do, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so we find ourselves in the same situation as individuals, as a congregation, and even as a nation. We have to make a decision in things that God requires of us. We're going to look at the four questions. First of all, has our nation turned its back against God? Has our nation turned its back against God? I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, we have Jesus as he is weeping over what he sees here over the city of Jerusalem. Look at verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till I shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Here we have a picture of Jesus who is crying, a weeping, over the condition of the city of Jerusalem, and how that the Jews have turned their back upon him. A.D. 7 came the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, and the Romans uh, did not leave a stone unturned as far as the city of Jerusalem was concerned. Look, if you will, over in Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 41, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench upon thee, compass thee around, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Judgment came upon the city of Jerusalem. Now when it comes to nations, the same thing applies. As we study the Old Testament history, we understand that God used the Assyrians to take into captivity the ten northern tribes of, of Israel. That was in 721. But we also noted that the two southern tribes, which still continued to, to be and exist as a nation un, for another 150 years approximately, were taken away by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king there. And that was in 586 B.C. The city of Jerusalem, the temple was destroyed. And so we see that happening. We also see in the, in the uh, dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in the book of Daniel, we see four great nations that arise. There is this image that he sees. And of course we know that within a certain part of this uh, dream that uh, the church is promised to be built that shall never be destroyed there, and that would be in the Roman Empire. But in that is mentioned the, the uh, Babylonian Empire, and then we also have the Greeks, and then we, uh, I mean, excuse me, the Medes and Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. That's the way it succeeded in history. Each nation was conquered by the succeeding nation. And the reason they were conquered was because of the fact each nation forgot who God was. They turned their back upon God. And so God, throughout the ages, has been one who demands of nations to do that which is right. But some would say, Preacher, what about all these other nations that are round about that are evil, and yet God continues to allow them to exist? 
and God will to a certain point. When God's cup of wrath gets filled, then the nation is taken out and done away with. And that's the way it's been throughout the ages. When the cup gets full, then God's wrath is moved against a particular nation. A lot of these nations are evil, yes. But they have not filled the cup yet. When the cup gets full, the nations will fall as they always have. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, the Bible talks about the Word and the fact that Jesus being the Word, He came into His own and His own received Him not. Well, the people of Israel, that is the Jews, who should have known the Messiah, who should have known the Christ, known the Christ, did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, did not accept Jesus as the Son of God. And as a result, we see that they themselves would be destroyed in A.D. 70 there with the great uh, taking over by the Roman Empire. In 2001, 9-11, we had a great tragedy that struck the United States. And in that particular tragedy, we had uh, people that were killed uh, for no reason whatsoever other than the fact of uh, a terrorist act, per se. We remember that uh, the next day after that attack, or maybe the next day after that, a couple of days after, we had all the people up there in Washington standing on the, on the steps, and they were singing uh, God Bless America uh, there. And how uh, all of a sudden we had a need for God. Now, sometimes we call that spare tire religion. And the reason being is we need God in the time of an emergency. And that's the only time we need Him. It seemed as though that great strike, that great terrorist act, caused fear to fall upon the hearts of many American people. And for a period of time, they had a desire all of a sudden for God to deliver them from evil. But where, where have they been in the last 15 years since that attack? Many of them are making decisions that are not right as far as God is concerned, especially our Supreme Court who has decided to say that one thing is right when God says it is wrong, not only once but twice on abortion and now on homosexuality, same-sex marriages there. And so when we look at the moral decay of a nation, that is what brings a nation down to its knees. That's what brings and fills God's cup of wrath. When you talk about morals... Yes, there are some good moral people in the United States. Don't, don't forget the fact. You remember when Elijah was thought he was all by himself after he had uh, killed the 450 prophets of Baal, and then he began to feel sorry for himself, and he wanted God to kill him. He wanted just to die. And God said to Elijah, Elijah, there are 7,000 people who have not bowed their knee to Baal yet. <clears throat> in other words... A nation may be doing things that are wrong, and they may doing, be doing some evil things, but there are some good people still in this nation in which we live. There are those that we can proudly call Christians even today because of what they believe and what they teach. <coughs> when it comes to morals, this nation has fallen a long way over the years. It is sad today that many <coughs> of our children that are being born are born out of wedlock. Among Hispanics, there are 43% births which are out of wedlock. Among African Americans, there are 70% births are born out of wedlock. And we could go on and on. And the fact is that we must teach <coughs> when it comes to morals. It seems as though we live in a world today that doesn't want to be told we're doing something wrong. Well, we need to be told we're doing some things wrong in this world in which we live. The fact is, people don't want to hear negative preaching, but the fact is, it needs to be heard because of the fact we're not doing what's right. If we were doing what's right, we wouldn't have to preach it per se. But the fact is, we all have to be reminded, even those of us who are Christians and have been Christians for a number of years still need to be reminded of what God's Word teaches and what it has to say to each and every one of us. So... A question we ask ourselves, has our nation turned its back against God? Well, we have turned in a lot of ways, but have we filled the cup of God's wrath? I do not know the answer to that question as of yet. Number two, has the church turned her back against God? Now, in the Bible, the Bible teaches in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 and 19, 
Jesus said, <coughs> said upon the great confession that Peter made, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, how many churches did Jesus say he would build? He said, I would build my church. We know from the Bible in studying Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 where there is one body. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 and 23 where the body is the church and Jesus is the head of the body. And we note from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10 that there are to be no divisions among us. Then we understand that there is but one church that Jesus built when he came to this earth to die and to shed his blood for us. Jesus did not shed his blood for denominations. Jesus shed his blood for his church. There are many people in the world today who are following their creed books. They're following men. They're following their catechisms. They're following anything and everything but thus saith the Lord. The Bible is the word of God. It is the Bible which will judge us in the last day. Jesus said in John 12, 48, the words that I speak, the same shall judge you in the last day. We understand that as Christians we should, but people in the world today do not believe the Bible is relevant. The Bible is not applicable to us today, but the Bible is applicable. There were those even in the time of Jeremiah. You go all the way back for the history of time, uh, history of time and you will see there have always been those that didn't think the Bible was applicable to them. There is always somebody that doesn't think law is applicable to them. If you write a law, you make a law, it applies to everybody but them because people don't want to be told what they must do, supposedly. But you know the Bible throughout reminds God's people every time in every place about the fact of what they need to do as far as their lives are concerned. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Peter tells us we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. That is life, our relationship with man, and godliness, our relationship with God, and how we deal with Him <coughs> there. We know from Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. If anyone is going to be saved, if anyone is going to be, go to heaven, it is going to be through the gospel and nothing else. It is the power of God unto salvation. How do I find salvation? Through the gospel. We are called by the gospel. First Thessalonians chapter two and verse or second Thessalonians chapter two and verse fourteen. The fact of the matter is, some have turned against as far as the church has turned their back against God because of ignorance. We live in a day and time when there is more technology than there ever has been in the world, we have more Bibles than there ever have been in different languages across this globe, and yet we have less knowledge of God's Word. Now why is that? <clears throat> is it the fact that we don't think the Word of God is relevant to us today? And our teenagers, when they grow up throughout life, do they realize that the Bible is the Word of God? Do they realize that if they're going to remain faithful to God, they've got to study the book, they've got to see what the Bible has to say, they've not only got to see it, but dear friends, we've all got to make application to it. A lesson well taught is no good unless application can be made from it. And I learned that a long time ago when I began teaching in uh, <coughs> Bible study. Brother Gurley Hood was one that brought me to the side one day. And uh, I was teaching a young man's fourth, fifth, and sixth grade classes. And uh, I had uh, presented my lesson. He had two children in there. He sat in there with me one Sunday night or Wednesday night. I forget what, night, what time it was. But anyway, he sat in the class with me. <clears throat> and he said, you know, Troy, he said, I want to talk to you uh, after, after the class. And we did. We talked. And he said, you know, said uh, you did a wonderful job in presenting the facts. But he said you didn't make any application. I learned from what Brother Hood said. You can do all the preaching, all the teaching in all, of all, in all the world, but if you don't make application to it, if people don't take the Bible, they can read it all day long, but if it never applies to them, they're always thinking of someone else that needs to hear this or someone else that needs this or that, and they never make application to themselves, then what good is it to us? It's no good to us. We have failed in our study of the Bible if we read, but yet we don't make application to God's Word there. Third of all, has our families turned their back against God? 
We talked about the nation. We talked about the church. Now what about families? How families turn their backs against God. We know that families have a relationship which must be right with God. There's a way to teach your children. There's a way to bring up a family. We know the Bible gives us instructions. The book of Ephesians chapter 5 talks about husbands love your wives. In Ephesians chapter 6, how that children are to obey their parents and so on. We know that that's given. But friends, we also know that, yes, we should bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But we're also told in Proverbs 22 and verse 6 that we should train a child. Train him up in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not veer from it. The fact of the matter is, do we train our children? If we knew what our children would do down the road, 15, 20 years, five years after they get out of the home, on their own, by themselves, in a foreign place, I say a foreign place, that could be a foreign city as far as they're concerned. A lot of people never get away from home, very seldom, until they go away to college. And so to me, as far as thinking is concerned, they're in a foreign country because they're not used to being out on their own. But if you could see five years after they leave home and see what they're going to become and what they're going to do, I wonder if we'd work a little harder at training our children while they're at home. Friends, there's no way that we can do enough training as far as our children are concerned. The home is the backbone of any nation. And as the home goes, so goes the nation. And all you have to do is look at this nation now because of the decision that's been given by the Supreme Court of the United States and see where the home is going. The home is being taken away. As a matter of fact, if you are one who is married and have been married for any number of years, then it is very much a surprise to a lot of people because the day in which we live, people don't stay married very long. They may stay four or five years, six years, ten years, whatever, but they don't stay married 50 years long anymore. And so we need to think about that. What about our children? Are we training our children to realize that marriage is a commitment for life? Yes, it's not going to be easy, but if you work at it, you keep God's message in your heart, you do what God tells you to do, then most assuredly the marriage can survive in a world in which we live today. And believe you me, it's a wicked and evil world that we live in. Everywhere you turn, every corner you turn, there is evil on every hand. And so we as Christians have to work at it. As mothers and fathers, as husbands and wives, we must constantly be on guard to train our children in the way they should go. Teenagers must develop their own faith. It's not enough to, to work off of the faith of their parents. It is, they must have their own faith. For when they get out on their own, then they truly find out where they stand as far as their Christianity is concerned. A lot of times we lose our teenagers because once they leave and go to college, they get with a bunch of atheistic professors that teach them things that are not acceptable and right as far as God is concerned. They don't know how to defend it. They don't know how to, to overcome it. And so they succumb to it. They give in to it. And they go off into the world as sad as it is. That's the way it happens many times. Why? Because they didn't have their own faith. While they were at home, they had mother and father's faith. They were dependent upon them, but when they get on their own, then it's a different thing. Number four, have you turned your back against God? A question we need to ask ourselves. There's a great danger in that today in our world. We know from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 that judgment is coming. We're all going to give an account before God for the things that we have done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. As we said earlier, we're going to be judged by the word, that is, the words of Jesus, John 12 and verse 48, the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. In the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter uh, 6, I want us to look at verses 9 and 10. Ezekiel chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says that God <coughs> was heartbroken over Israel. Look at what is said of God, verse 9 and 10. And they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, whether they shall be carried captives, because I am broken with their whorish heart, which hath departed from me, and with their eyes which go a whoring after their idols, and they shall loathe themselves for the evils which they have committed in all their abominations 
And they shall know that I am the Lord, and that I have not said in vain that I would do this evil unto them. Now we all need to understand, we reap what we sow. That's a principle taught throughout the Scripture, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Whatsoever we sow, that shall we also reap. And friends, if we go through life and we are sowing to the world, we can expect to reap from the world. The farmer that goes out and sows oats does not expect to get soybeans. The farmer that goes out and sows corn does not expect to get cotton. Why is that? Well, we all know if you sow corn, you're going to get corn. If you sow cotton, you're going to get cotton. If you sow soybeans, you're going to get soybeans. You're not going to get something else because whatever you sow, that shall you also reap. And so when it comes to spiritual matters, it's the same way. We reap what we sow. So, what have we sown in the world today? What have we done for the Lord there? Have you turned your backs upon God? The book of Proverbs, chapter 14, and verse 34, the Bible says, Righteousness exalteth a nation. Righteousness that exalts a nation begins with us as individuals. It begins with us as individuals. You take a little leaven and you put it in a lump and what happens? It leavens the whole lump. We need to be leavened in the world in which we live. Rather than letting the world be leavened in us, we need to be leavened to the world. We need to be able to spread the gospel. We need to be able to teach individuals the word of God. Friends, the Bible is plain as to how God responds throughout the ages. Go all the way back to Adam and Eve. So long as Adam and Eve were faithful to God, God was faithful to them. And then it comes on down throughout the ages. And it's been that way. Even when the Bible is finished in A.D. 100, when John the Apostle wrote the last book, Revelation, <clears throat> we see that even these principles keep on going throughout the history of time. And they will continue to go so long as God allows the world to exist. He will do the same things He's always done. He's made America a great nation. A great nation we are. We used to be greater than we are now because we believed in God. Now we're trying to take God out of everything. Taking, taking Him out of our schools. We're trying to take Him out of the government. We're even trying to take God out of the church. Many would do that if they could. As sad as it is, that's what's happening in America today. Now, where do we stand as a nation? Where do we stand as a congregation of God's people? Where do we stand as far as a family is concerned? Where do we stand individually with God? It's important because of the fact that one day we have to give an account of the things we've done in our body, whether it be good or bad. If you're here this morning, you're not a member of the Lord's church. The greatest thing that you can do is be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hear the word. Believe it. Repent of your sins. Confess the good name. And be baptized for the remission of your sins. And in so doing, the Lord will add you to the church. If you are a member of the church, you've gone astray. Maybe you've turned your back on God for whatever reason. And yet you need to repent of those sins. And we encourage you to do that as well. As together we stand and as we sing.